And then uh, if we see lecture six, we see the life of Jesus. So God, he truly wants us to know who the Messiah is. God wants to reveal to us who the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ, they're all the same word in different languages, but Christ, Messiah, anointed one, they're all the same. So he wants us to know who is this Messiah? How can we know who is that fulfillment? God is so good to us that he writes more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament just so that we can know who this Messiah is. Because if he didn't specify, then we might get confused. But God is so detailed that he wrote more than 300 prophecies. And here in your lecture, you see a, uh, you see a list of just some of them. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 17 and 18, you see that um, God promises to Abraham that through his seed, through his lineage, the nations would be blessed, right? But this is not talking about about blessing only his, his line, his family line or his family. He's saying, when through your seed, in singular, that is to say, when he who comes out of the lineage comes, he who is out of the lineage, that seed will be a blessing to all nations. He's promising that the Messiah will come through the lineage of Abraham. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8 to 16, it is, it is promised to David as well that through his lineage, through his descendants, his, the kingdom of God will not be removed and that constantly God will endorse this throne of, of the lineage of David. That is not to say that God was promising to David that he would have a constant lineage, but he's saying through, my, through your lineage, David, the Messiah will come. So here we have two very important clues. If the Messiah comes, he must come through the lineage of Abraham and of David. And that is also fulfilled in the life of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, we see a genealogy. If you've uh, read the, uh, the, uh, the Gospels, you see that uh, they have a genealogy. And why is that genealogy important? It is to confirm that this Jesus who came was the promised Messiah. If you look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, we have seen this already. It says that he must come from a virgin. One of the signs that cannot be replicated by any other, because many people may replicate these signs, but one of the signs that cannot be replicated is that he must come from a virgin, right? And this is only something that only Jesus has done by his birth in the Holy Spirit. He was not the seed of Adam. He was not from the seed of a sinner, but rather he was born of the Holy Spirit as the offspring of the woman because he needed to come without sin to this world. In Micah chapter 5 verse 2 says that he must be born in the town of Bethlehem. It's so specific, right? He must be born in the town of Bethlehem. When the Messiah comes, he will be born in that town. And that was fulfilled in Matthew chapter 2. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12 to 13, it says that he must be sold for 30 pieces of silver. God is so specific that he's saying, when the Messiah comes, he must be betrayed and he must be sold for 30 pieces of silver. You know how, for how much Jesus was sold, right? Then... In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22 and 23, it says that he must be hung on a tree as a testimony that he's cursed by the law. If you check the law in Deuteronomy, it says that everyone who is hung on the tree is accursed. He is, um, that is to say, he, he is cursed, he is cast out. That was the law according to Israel. That was to say, this law was set in place to foretell that he who is hung on the tree will bear all the curses, he will bear all sins of, of the people. The Messiah must come and he must do this. Math, uh, Isaiah chapter 53 verse 9 says that after he is hung on the tree, after he is crucified, he must be buried in the tomb of a rich man. And we know that when Jesus dies in the cross, that his body gets taken away by someone. And this someone is Joseph of Arimathea. This was a rich man. And this man buried Jesus on his tomb. And in Psalms chapter 16, verse 10, it says that this Messiah, he must not stay with the dead, but that he must resurrect in order to prove that he is God. Psalms chapter 16, verse 10 tells us about this. And Matthew chapter 28, verse 1 to 10 tells us that this tr truly happened. 
So, and we're just going fast here, but there is a great wealth of shadows, of symbols, and of clues in all the Old Testament. For instance, the Old Testament tells us that his bones must not be broken for him to be the Messiah. It tells us that he must drink wine mixed with guile in, in his last moments. It tells us that he will uh, be consumed by the wrath of God and he will overturn the tables in, the, in God's house. It tells us that how he will perform miracles. It tells us of how he must live. It tells us that he must ride a donkey colt into the city. It tells us so many details that he will be betrayed by his friends. That It tells us that uh, his bones will be exposed at that moment in the tree. And that people will, uh, will, uh, they will take his clothes and they will share it uh, by lottery, right? So there are so many details. And this is so specific. So who is the Messiah? Who is that person or, or that being that God has promised through all his scriptures? It is the person or the being who fulfills the more than 300 prophecies in the Bible without fail. God is so specific in that way. God wants us to know the Messiah in such a way. For instance, if you were invested in me knowing one of your friends, just as an example, and I don't know that friend and I need to go meet that friend at the station, what would you do with me? You would tell me the details about this person, right? You'll tell me, okay, this person's name is this, the, uh, this person dresses this way, this person will come from that station, this person is uh, of a certain height, uh, that person will have certain characteristics. You would tell me every detail about that person. Well, God is truly invested in us meeting this Messiah because that is the only way to salvation. That is the only solution to man's problems. And he gives us more than 300 prophecies. So, if you look at the life of Jesus then, after all these prophecies, let us look at Matthew chapter 4, please. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, uh, synthesizes the, uh, the public ministry of Jesus in a, very con in a very condensed way. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So here we can see how Jesus did his ministry, and, and it tells us three things. He taught in the synagogues. So Jesus taught in the synagogues, and what did he teach? Have you ever wondered that? What did he, Jesus teach in the synagogues? Did he teach how to be a good person? Did he teach that you should do this and that? What was Jesus teaching at the synagogues? Please just wonder about it. And then it says, he preached the good news of the kingdom. He preached the gospel, not only in the synagogues, but he did it with so many people as well outside. What did he preach? What was his message? Then you see that he healed every disease and sickness among the people. Why did he heal the sick? Why did he heal, uh, heal every disease in people? It, it, is it because Jesus was compassionate? Is it just because Jesus, he was uh, seeing the suffering of the poor and, and, and he was just so very compassionate to them? Why did he resurrect Lazarus if he was going to die again? Why did he feed the 5,000 people if they were going to go, go hungry again? There was a specific reason why Jesus did all of those things. All of Jesus' ministry was devoted to showing, I am the fulfillment of all the scriptures. I am he. I am that Messiah. And because the Messiah will come and he will heal the sick and he will do all sorts of wonders, that is why he did it. The underlying message of all the illnesses, uh, the, the healings and all the miracles was I am that Messiah. What did he teach? I am that Messiah. What did he preach? I am that Messiah. The kingdom of heaven has come, so you need to repent. What, what is the kingdom of God? The king of that kingdom of heaven has come. I am that kingdom of heaven. That was Jesus' public ministry. But even if he did that, all, uh, that public ministry for three years and a half, the core of his ministry was in the cross and resurrection. Because in that cross and resurrection, he fulfills the work of the Messiah perfectly. He fulfills the work of the Christ. If we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20, Hebrews chapter 10, please. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 20, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. As you well know, 
In the moment that Jesus bore the cross, the skies darkened, there were earthquakes, uh, the death started to rise from the tombs, and many things happened. But the first, uh, but uh, a foremost thing that happened was that the veil in the temple was torn. As you know, this temple was divided into certain parts, and and uh, behind the veil you saw the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was the place where the Ark of the Covenant rested and the presence of God manifested. That is to say, if you were to cross the veil, you would meet God, right? That's the essence of it. You would meet God after crossing that veil. But the issue was, if you were a sinner, then you would die when meeting the presence of God. I don't know if you recall the part where the Philistines have taken the ark uh, from the hands of David, right? And, and then they fight, and, and God guides some soldiers to bring back the ark to the temple. And in, in that trip, uh, the, one of the soldiers stumbles, and, and then he catches the ark with his hands, and then he dies immediately. And when I was young, I always wondered, why is that? He was doing such a good thing. Why did God kill this man? What, what, what happened? Why, why did it happen? But later on I realized that the presence of God is so holy and sinners, as we discussed before, cannot be with God who is holy. Sin dies in the presence of God that is so holy. So that is to say, if you would cross the, the, uh, to the Holy of Holies, you would die in the presence of God. That is why only once a year in the Day of Atonement, only the high priest, after atoning for his sins and the sins of his people, he would enter this place uh, to offer the blood of redemption and he would enter that most holy place but he would do so with certain precautions he would tie a sash around his waist and there will be um, like bells in his sacerdotal robes and why would that happen it's because he needed to enter and if by some um, if by some chance he had not cleansed his own sin or the sins of the people were not cleansed he would go in he would meet God and he would die so the people outside could not come in and, and take him out right they would die as well so they would just pull in the sash wherever, whenever they heard the bells not ringing anymore. So meeting God, being in the presence of God was something, uh, was, something uh, was a great honor. It was a great privilege, but it was also something to be feared. If you were that high priest in, in that year, how would you feel? You'd feel terrified in some respect. So entering the most holy place was no joke. But here in the verse in Hebrew, it says that now we have a confidence to enter that most holy place. Now we dare enter that most holy place. Why? Because it says that there is a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. When the curtain was torn, it was not only the, the curtain in the temple. The body of Jesus was torn upon that cross. He tore his own flesh so that through him, then we might cross unto God. That is the way to meet God. That is why he can say, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is what happened in the cross. That is why he's a true prophet who bridged this over with God. Then if we see in um, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 please Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood having obtained eternal redemption here it says that the blood of the goats and the calves was imperfect but he did not use that blood of animal sacrifice but by his own blood the blood of God himself was shed on that cross Every drop of blood, every drop of water was shed on that cross. Why? So that we might have an eternal redemption, a perfect redemption. The blood of Jesus is enough so that all of the sin of all mankind, past, present, and future, is resolved once, eternally, and perfectly. That is the price of the blood of Jesus on that cross. We're still sinners, of course. We still fail. And when God the judge sees us, he used to see our sin selves failing over and over again. But now that He has died in the cross and His blood has been shed, that blood is covering us. So when the judge sees us, He does not see our sin. He sees the blood of the righteous Lamb. That is what happened at the cross. All sin, therefore, has a solution in Him who is the high priest, the true high priest of God, who has given us an eternal, perfect solution to sin. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 2, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 it says since since the children have flesh and blood he too shared in their humanity 
so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. It says, why did he participate of flesh and blood? Why did he come with flesh and blood? He needed to die. The Messiah needed to die. He needed to be wounded on his heel. But why? It is so that by his death, he might destroy the one who has power over death. Colossians also tells us that when he was on the cross, he publicly exposed all the authorities, all the powers. He exposed them publicly in the cross, having victory over them. It was not him who died on that cross that day. Satan was defeated on that cross. And in his resurrection, he proves that he has defeated death. What is resurrection but defeating death? And what is defeating death but be defeating the master of death who is Satan? He is the true king who has gotten rid of that usurper, Satan, and has brought us victory. He is the true king who has defeated Satan in our lives. So in that cross and resurrection, Jesus himself fulfills that work. He is the true priest. He is the true king. He is the true prophet. He is the fulfillment of all the Bible. And that is why we can say that the core message of the Bible and the, mes the message that all the apostles and the churches preached was only one. Why did they not preach anything else? Why did they not preach about victory? Why did they not preach about family? Why did they not preach about other things. Why? It was because this message was enough. This message of the cross and resurrection of the Christ, that Jesus is that Christ who through the cross and resurrection resolved everything, that is the message that gave them life. And if you're heading to a world that is full of death, of sin, and Satan, then can you afford to preach another message? Can you afford to believe another message? This is the perfect answer of God. This is the perfect covenant of God. Just as soon as we broke the last covenant, God gives us a new covenant. The Messiah will come. And that will not depend on your own keeping. That Messiah will do it for you. God has given the greatest answer already. And Jesus, throughout all His life, He was testifying that He is the Christ. And through His cross and resurrection, He fulfilled that work so perfectly that in John chapter 19, verse 30, when He's at the cross, He says, It is finished. He did not say, I have finished it. He did not say, oh, uh, I forgot about this. Sorry, pray for this part because I didn't do it. He said, it is finished. I completely did it. This is a perfect message from God. A lot of people ask, if God is so good, why am I having so much trouble? If God is so good, why is there war? If God is so good, why do you see so much depression? Why do you see so many problems in the whole world? But I think it, when reading the Bible, the question becomes different. The question is not, why is God not doing anything about it? God already sent His Son. God already sent the Messiah. The problem is that we choose not to believe that He's perfect. We choose not to believe in His answer. So uh, through this time, I would truly like you to meditate upon this. What is the problem of life? You are people who must be spiritual doctors, right? You are here to give an answer to the people. You must diagnose the problem well, and you must give the correct solution. If not, then nothing will work out. What is the correct diagnosis? The problem of man is just one. We're separated from God. Why are we separated from God? Because of sin. Why have we sinned? Because Satan has influenced our lives. And this is our first and foremost problem. What is the solution? God has promised the Messiah through more than 300 prophecies. He has promised the true king who would defeat Satan, the true priest who would resolve our sin, and the true prophet who would bring us back to God. Who is this Messiah? Who is this Christ? Who is this anointed one? There is only one Messiah, only one Christ, and that is Jesus. That is why the message of all the Bible is Jesus is the Christ. And that is the answer that we need, that I need in my life. So. That is the gospel. In a nutshell, that is the gospel. And I hope the gospel can be restored in your life, not as knowledge, but as belief. Because knowing and believing are two different things. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you because you have allowed us to explain a little bit about the gospel. Please allow revelation in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we believe that there are some people here who will be used by you to save Canada. God, would you please Give us more light. Would you please give us more insight and more faith, more revelation 
and the fact that Jesus is the Christ and this is the only thing we need. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, we will... Oh, announcements? Okay. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, uh, okay. there's food just outside the door to the left. We've got some pizzas and a whole bunch of different things that you guys can help yourselves to. Uh,